Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Patrice Kelch, and it is my um, great, great pleasure to introduce tonight's um, guest uh, presenter, Meg Brandelin. So, um, Meg is a student of both Buddhist and Christian contemplative paths. And this informs her engagement as a hospice and palliative care physician. And she brings her practice to being really present with people and often people who are in the most vulnerable uh, situations. In this, she offers wisdom and compassion and skillful means. Um, she really brings her whole self her whole practice into the room in um, some really um, intense, poignant, amazing situations. And uh, she is someone who really embodies skillful means. I would love to have her at my deathbed. Um, I also know that um, Meg can be um, playful, and curious and um, I have been told that her bucket list includes learning French, writing books, and realizing the awakened heart. So I am just so happy that she is going to be sharing the Dharma with us tonight and something that I have such a, a big interest in which is the last days of the Buddha. So this is a, an enormously interesting topic to me and I um, look forward to it. So thank you, Meg, for being here this evening. And you can now unmute yourself. Thank you so much, Patrice. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I know we have some folks at the city center, um, and then we have a variety of people from all over um, joining in on Zoom. And um, I'm coming from Rochester, Minnesota. I used to live up in Minneapolis and now I live down in Rochester. And we will follow kind of the typical program where we'll start with a meditation, um, kind of part meditation, part contemplation for about 25 or 30 minutes. And then we'll transition into the Dharma talk and then we'll have a little bit of time for question and answer. So you can find a comfortable position and if you're comfortable with closing your eyes, I encourage you to. And just starting by relaxing the body and relaxing the mind. And I'm going to read the five subjects for frequent recollection taught by the Buddha. Those of you who've been at Common Ground or who have practiced with other insight meditation communities will likely be familiar with these. And I'm going to read the traditional version and we'll just pause for a moment after that. And then I'm going to read a revised version that I wrote for tonight. So you can just receive these with an open heart and we'll sit together um, afterwards. Five subjects for frequent recollection. I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. I am of the nature to die. I have not gone beyond dying. All that is mine, beloved and pleasing, will become otherwise will become separated from me. I am the owner of my comma, heir to my comma, born of my comma. Whatever comma I shall do for good or for ill, of that I will be the heir. And this is the revised edition of the five subjects for frequent recollection. This precious body is of the nature to age. It has not gone beyond aging. I know that it's not easy to live in an aging body, 
and I care about it. This precious body is of the nature to sicken. It has not gone beyond sickness. I know that it is not easy to live in a body that is sick, and I care about it. This precious body is of the nature to die. It has not gone beyond dying. I know that the process of dying is not easy, and I care about it. I know that all that is mine in this world, all that is beloved and pleasing to my senses, will become separated from me. And I care about learning how to relate wisely to this truth. I know that I am the owner of my intentional actions and that my intentional actions shape the circumstances of my life and my death. I care about this and I believe in the possibility of freedom, compassion, and peace in all of these circumstances. So I'm going to ring the bell and I'll provide some simple meditation instructions and then in about 20 minutes, I'll ring the bell again. So just inviting relaxation into the body and mind. You may notice areas of tension in the body. You can invite those areas to release. Feeling the weight of the body on the cushion or chair. and sitting in this relaxed, but also upright way. And connecting with the heart that cares. The heart that cares enough about these teachings and about your life to show up tonight and to learn. and the heart that cared about other people, the earth, communities, connecting with this boundless heart that knows how to care and that knows how to respond to all situations. And just tuning into the body first. Reflecting on all that the body does for us every day, often without our even knowing it. Digesting our food and breathing and walking and hugging. Just reflecting with gratitude on the body. And reflecting on the fact that the body is not always in our control. And that as much as we would like to uh, direct our bodies in certain ways and to change things about our bodies, knowing that we're not always able to change things in the way that we would like and that the body is part of nature and that it has its own energies and 
its own processes. And just because the body is not in our control doesn't mean that we, we stop caring about it or that we can't care about it. So just dropping in the question, is it possible to be present with and to care about this body in all circumstances, whether young or old, healthy or sick, or whether the body is dying? Can this be okay? And can I offer care and kindness to the body? Is it possible for everything in our bodies, in our minds, and in our lives to be included and to belong? And just reflecting, what does it mean to show up for a body that hurts, for a body that is sick or dying, whether that is your body or the body of a dear friend? What is it like to open to that with kindness?
reflecting on the activity of the mind, thoughts and feelings, ideas, just noticing the changing nature of the mind and asking, what is it like to say yes to everything that's here in this moment? What if everything belongs? Can I be present with this and yet recognize with wisdom that these thoughts are not who I am? That these thoughts and feelings are part of nature and they're moving and changing according to causes and conditions. Can I care about this and keep showing up for it even when it seems difficult? And just settling in with either a contemplation that resonated with you or an anchor that you use in your meditations. It could be the breath, it could just be mindfulness of the body, whatever feels right. And we'll sit for another minutes or so.
I'm going to read the five subjects for frequent recollection, revised edition, one more time before I ring the bell. This precious body is of the nature to age. It has not gone beyond aging. I know that it's not easy to live in an aging body and I care about it. This precious body is of the nature to sicken. It has not gone beyond sickness. I know that it's not easy to live in a body that is sick and I care about it. This precious body is of the nature to die. It has not gone beyond dying. I know that the process of dying is not easy and I care about it. I know that all that is mine in this world, all that is beloved and pleasing to my senses will become separated from me. And I care about learning how to relate wisely to this truth. I know that I am the owner of my intentional actions and that my intentional actions shape the circumstances of my life and my death. I care about this and I believe in the possibility of freedom, compassion, and peace in all of these circumstances. So you're welcome to stretch for a few seconds if you need to. I'm just gonna change one thing here. Okay. So, welcome everyone. I'm not going to waste much time uh, before jumping into the topic tonight because we have a lot to cover. I'm going to be speaking about the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which is translated as the great passing away or the discourse on the final nirvana or the great final extinction. And the Sutta is the story of the Buddha's last days on earth and of his final release from the cycle of suffering and the round of rebirth. It might be a slightly different style of Dharma talk um, because it really tells a story and it's historical and it's um, really rooted in early Buddhism. And I'm going to talk a, about, um, I'll define a few terms before we jump into it um, just to provide some clarity. The Sutta gives instructions to the followers of the Buddha to continue to follow what he taught after he's gone. It also provides a beautiful example of how a human being can go through the process of illness and aging and death with great freedom and peace. And every person, every teacher that teaches on the sutta will do so in a unique way based on their experiences and and personality and um, I'm just going to mention that I will be including some of my experiences working with patients that are dying um, because I think that is as much um, a part of my Dharma practice as formal meditation. So it's a very practical um, approach to kind of understanding the sutta. There are some other versions that are very scholarly or more mythological. Um, but I'll, I'll focus kind of more on some of the practicalities tonight. A um, couple of facts about the sutta that some of you may be interested in. This is actually the longest sutta in the Sutta Pitaka, which is the collection of around 10,000 discourses given by the Buddha and his disciples. It's part of the, the Diga Nikaya, the long discourses. And it has a narrative structure. 
So Ajahn Brahmali, when he was talking about this sutta, said it's not really a sutta at all, because typically a sutta includes a particular teaching, for example, the Four Noble Truths. Um, but this sutta includes biographical material about the Buddha and is spoken through the voice of a narrator, not only the voice of the Buddha. And it is said that in some traditions, the sutta is actually part of the Vinaya, which is the um, kind of code for the monks to live by, based on how the Buddha lived. A couple of words that are important to know, um, especially if you're new to Buddhism and new to um, common ground. There's this word Tathagata, and this is the word that the Buddha uses to refer to himself. So he does not use the pronouns I, me, or myself. He says the Tathagata. This translates as one who has thus gone or one who has thus come. And um, it kind of refers to a being that is beyond duality, is beyond coming and going, and is kind of beyond the um, vicissitudes of, of the human realm. Um, some words used to describe Tathagata are immeasurable, hard to fathom, and not apprehended. Another word that many of you will be familiar with is Mara. Mara is the kind of mythological personification of greed, anger, and delusion. What we call the defilements, the things that obscure our minds and lead to suffering. In this tradition, um, there's sort of this character named Mara that represents these things. And he's sometimes referred to as the Buddha's tempter or the evil one. Um, and he attempts throughout the Buddha's life to prevent his awakening and then to prevent him from teaching. He makes a, a cameo appearance in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. So the other word is Nibbana or Nib nirvana or nibbana which translates as to blow out or to extinguish as with a flame and in buddhism it refers to the cessation of suffering and of rebirth and there's actually two types of nibbana there's sopadisa nibbana which is nibbana with life remaining um, so it's a person who has awakened, is, is enlightened, but still has life to live and may still have karma um, to ripen. And then parinibbana means nibbana without a remainder. So this is the final or the highest kind of release. Um, and it happens at the time of death. So that brings us to the title of the sutta, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. So it's the great passing away into final Dibbana, um, which, which is what the Buddha does. Um, it was really interesting. I was looking up other talks on this topic just to see what was out there. And there are 38,300 talks on Dharma Seed right now, and I was able to find seven that mentioned either Mahaparinibbana, last days of the Buddha, or last sermon. So it's not, in my experience, commonly taught in the West. There are some talks by, primarily by monastics on YouTube, including an 18 hour um, lecture series by Ajahn Brahmali, if you're interested in digging deeper. Um, but additionally, I looked up um, Maranasati or mindfulness of death and I only found 100 talks. And then when I searched death and dying, I found about 700 total of 38,000 talks, which I thought was a small number given how much the Buddha um, spoke about mindfulness of death and contemplations on death as conducive to awakening. So. I'm happy to add Dharma talk number eight to <laughs> Dharma seed on this topic tonight. It is different than Maranasati. We're not doing mindfulness of death with this. And it's different than the Tibetan teachings on kind of 
the transference of consciousness and bardo states and all of that um, as described in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So those are different topics. We're going to talk about the Buddha's last days tonight. Okay, so this sutta is divided into six sections. I might refer to them as sections or, or kind of chapters. And the first section is called In Magadha. So Magadha is one of the great kingdoms in ancient India, and it's in the region of the present day Bihar state in the northeastern part of India next to Nepal. And the story opens with the king of Magadha wanting to wage war on a group of people called the Vajis. He says he wants to annihilate them, to utterly destroy them. But before he does this, he decides to seek counsel from the Buddha because he knows that the Buddha is very wise and can likely provide some good advice. So he asks his chief minister to go to the Buddha to pay homage to him and to ask him for his advice. And the Buddha responds by asking Ananda, who's a very important character. Ananda is the Buddha's cousin and his personal attendant. He asks Ananda about the behavior and the integrity of the Vaji people. He goes through a whole list that includes, you know, do they um, act ethically? Do they respect their elders? Do they respect um, some of the traditions, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And he says, if they do these things, if they're acting with integrity, with ethical conduct, then their growth is to be expected and not their decline. And the chief minister of the king of Magadha hears this and he understands what the Buddha is saying. He says, no harm indeed can come to the Vajis in battle by Magadha's king except through treachery or discord. And with this, he takes leave of the Buddha. So he understands that there's, there's some kind of force or sort of protective energy about the Vajis in this story that comes from their integrity, their ethical conduct, their sila. And so this is sort of a story that leads to what the Buddha is going to teach his followers. After this story is shared, the Buddha speaks to the community of monks, the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, and later to the lay people. And he says that the most important things for you are to cultivate ethical conduct and mindfulness, loving kindness, concentration, and wisdom. And if you do these things, your community will grow. Your growth will be expected, not your decline. So he's thinking about his absence and kind of what will lead to the continuation of these teachings and to this community. And he says the foundation for passing on these teachings is ethical conduct, is mindfulness, concentration, wisdom. And for the lay people, the householders, so all of us who are not monastics, he describes five perils and five blessings of the life of a householder. The perils stem from heedlessness, which I think of as kind of lack of mindfulness, um, you know, not, not paying attention, not being sensitive to cause and effect. And he says, heedlessness leads to a loss of wealth, a poor reputation, a timid and troubled demeanor, death in bewilderment, and rebirth in a realm of misery and unhappy state. On the other hand, the five blessings accrue to a righteous man or woman um, through the practice of virtue. And these include great increase of wealth through diligence, a favorable reputation, a confident deportment, and a serene death. Also rebirth in a happy state in a heavenly world. So this is just the first section 
of a very long sutta, but I think it it kind of sets the stage in terms of the Buddha's emphasis on sila, on ethical conduct, and on integrity for um, living a life that is free from suffering and for having a peaceful death and for those who believe in the process of rebirth, for having um, rebirth in a happy state or a, a better state. And I was thinking about this. I, I've kind of reflected on each one of these sections of the sutta in the context of the work that I do with people who are dying or very sick. And there are many ways, I think, that people who've lived a life of integrity and who have practiced ethical conduct, never perfectly, but who have tried, um, seem to have more peace at the end of their lives. And I think one of the reasons is what the Buddha called the bliss of blamelessness. So not having regrets, not having um, kind of, in Buddhism we talk more about wholesome regrets, hiriyotapa, um, but not having that weighing on your mind when you're sick and when you're nearing the end of your life. Also, the beautiful benefits that come from wholesome relationships, from treating other people with kindness, from telling the truth. All of these things, when we practice them throughout our lives, I think as the Buddha tells us here, and as I've seen in real life, I think they can help us to experience the process of dying with a heart that is much freer than if we don't practice them. So in some ways, this first part of the sutta isn't completely related to all of the rest of the events that happen, but I think it's really important um, and something that uh, we may not think about as a cause for happiness in our kind of uh, fast-paced culture, but which really is important, um, which is our sila, our ethical conduct. The only other thing I'll say about this first part is that we're introduced to some of the supernatural abilities of the Buddha that continue to show up throughout the rest of the sutta. And these include his ability to see into the realm of deities, divine beings, with what is referred to as his heavenly eye, to make predictions about the future. And at one point, he somewhat miraculously transports his body across the flooded Ganges River. Um, so kind of seeing these um, abilities in the context of his human life is a theme throughout the sutta. So the second section is called Journey to Visali or Vaishali, which is another ancient city in present day Bihar, India. This section opens with a teaching on the Four Noble Truths by the Buddha to a group of monks. He then discusses the four stages of awakening, which are basically um, descriptions of the progressive kind of refinement of the heart and mind. And throughout the first part of this section, the Buddha continues to encourage the development of virtue, sila, concentration, and wisdom. And he reminds the monks that there are great gains and great fruits for those who practice them. Towards the end of the section, the Buddha is invited to a meal by a courtesan named Ambapali. And there's a conflict after Ambapali asked the Buddha to dinner because another group of people called the Luchavis wanted to do the same. And the Buddha accepts Ambapali's invitation because that was 
offered first and he tells the Lichavis that he's not going to be able to to come to their meal um, and there's quite a bit of um, uh, arguing and harsh speech that the Lichavis give to Ambapali but the next day the Buddha takes his bowl and his robe and he goes together with the community of bhikkhus to Ambapali's land and they're served a meal and she actually gives the Buddha the land that they're sitting on as an offering. And this is another story in kind of this introductory part of the sutta where you wonder kind of, okay, like, why is that in there? <laughs> you know, like, I bet he had a lot of meals and a lot of, you know, uh, gifts offered to him. But I think what it, what it highlights is just the practice of generosity of dana and this is one of the paramis or one of the qualities of the awakened heart and it's something that i think is emphasized less in buddhism as practiced in america i lived in thailand for a couple of years and i always felt like generosity was foundational to their spiritual practice and i felt it and i received so much and I think um, I can see why it's, you know, emphasized here and in the sutta because it, it really is an important um, practice, I think, on the spiritual path. So the most important part of this section is when the Buddha becomes sick for the first time. This happens at the beginning of the rains retreat. And I'm going to read an excerpt from the sutta describing this experience. When the blessed one had entered upon the rainy season, there arose in him a severe illness, a sharp and sharp and deadly pains came upon him. And the blessed one endured them mindfully, clearly comprehending and unperturbed. Then it occurred to the blessed one it would not be fitting if I came to my final passing away without addressing those who attended on me, without taking leave of the community of bhikkhus. Then let me suppress this illness by strength of will, resolve to maintain the life process and live on. And the blessed one suppressed the illness by strength of will, resolve to maintain the life process and lived on. So it came about that the blessed one's illness was allayed. This passage demonstrates a few things, one of which is the Buddha's ability to be free from suffering despite physical illness that includes sharp and deadly pains. The second is the thoughtfulness that he shows in wanting to make sure that he takes proper leave of the community of bhikkhus. In modern day palliative care practice, we would call this advanced care planning <laughs> where we think about, you know, what are the important things that you need to do before you go? Um, you know, let's make sure that happens. Kind of thinking about other people in his life um, and making sure that they're okay. Um, and the third thing is this, this power of mind that he demonstrates and kind of power of will to influence these energies of life. Um, in order to stay alive longer. So the Buddha recovers from this first illness and his attendant, Ananda, expresses overwhelming joy and relief. Ananda says, when I saw the Blessed One's sickness, it was as if my own body became weak. Everything around became dim to me and my senses failed me. And Ananda goes on to say that he was hoping that the Buddha would not pass away until he'd given them some last instructions. And the Buddha responds somewhat surprisingly by saying, Ananda, what else do you expect from me? I've taught you everything you need to know and I haven't held anything back from you. Um, and he says, now I am frail, Ananda, old, aged, far gone in years. This is my 80th year and my life is spent. Even as an old cart, Ananda, is held together with much difficulty, 
so the body of the Tathagata is kept going only with supports. He then goes on to explain that it's only when he's in meditation, deep states of meditation, that he's able to um, feel more comfort in his body. And the section closes with a very famous line from the Buddha, where he says, therefore, Ananda, be islands unto yourselves, refuges unto yourselves, seeking no external refuge with the Dhamma, the truth of the way things are, as your island, the Dhamma as your refuge, seeking no other refuge. So I was thinking about this second section and the theme that came up for me was letting go. I think with the story of Ambapali that opens this section, we are taught about letting go through the act of generosity, through giving and thinking about other people. And during the Buddha's sickness, we're taught about letting go of our attachment to the body and to um, health and to um, kind of youth. And lastly, with the body's, uh, with the Buddha's response to Ananda, um, I think the Buddha is trying to teach Ananda to begin to let go of his attachment to him, his beloved teacher. And so when he says, be islands unto yourself, he's saying, if you want to be fully free, we have to begin to learn to let go in all of these different ways. There's a lot that I could say um, about this theme of letting go from my work in palliative care and hospice. Um, but there's two patients that come to mind that I took care of within the last few months um, that really taught me a lot about letting go. And one of them was a young woman with cancer in her 20s and she was dying and she was at the um, kind of end of uh, further treatment options and she had come into the hospital with an infection. And, and she made the very courageous decision with the support of her family to enroll in hospice and to go home and to die at home. And I just remember being in her room and feeling an incredible sense of lightness and peace. And she was a spiritual person. She was a religious person. And I think that helped her a great deal. But I just heard, remember her family would just wave us, wave us in from the hallway, the palliative care team, because she, they would say, oh, are you, are you the team that's going to protect her from like going on a ventilator and having all these interventions? And um, I had never seen a patient that young with that much grace and acceptance and willingness to trust the process and to let go. And it's a patient I will always remember. A couple of months later, I had a patient who was elderly, uh, kind of, I think mid eighties, and she'd been diagnosed with uh, acute leukemia, which the prognosis is typically days to weeks or potentially months, um, but probably weeks with no treatment. And I went to talk to her about hospice and about, you know, kind of transitioning to more of a comfort focused approach. And her loving family was in the room, her son and daughter-in-law, and the patient was really not interested in talking about hospice or talking about end of life. And the patient's daughter-in-law was reflecting and saying, you know, you've lived such a wonderful life. You have all these blessings, you have grandkids, you know, and the patient just responded and said, it's not enough. <laughs> um, and we just like, my team have continued to kind of like think about this case as, you know, you can have all of these beautiful things and you can have a belief that it's not enough and you can suffer immensely because of that. And so two hugely different cases 
60 plus years apart in age and completely different ways of relating to death and dying that came from the heart, that came from their mind, that came from their choices. Um, and so I think, you know, in the second section of the sutta, this kind of introduction to letting go, which some would say this whole path is about, um, but clearly a, a very important thing. So we're on to section three of six. And this section is called Relinquishing the Will to Live. I, I was thinking of this section as um, the completion section. And in order to understand it fully, we have to first review some information about the Buddha's life and his decision to teach in the first place. Many of you are familiar with the story of how the Buddha decided to teach. But for those who are not, I'll share a couple of excerpts from another sutta. It's the Ayachana Sutta, The Request. So shortly after the Buddha became enlightened, he was sitting under a banyan tree. And it is said that the thought came to him. This Dhamma that I have attained is deep, hard to see, hard to realize, peaceful, refined, beyond the scope of conjecture, subtle to be experienced by the observant. But this generation delights in attachment, is excited by attachment, enjoys attachment. For a generation delighting in attachment, excited by attachment, enjoying attachment, this, that conditionality and dependent co-arising to teachings within Buddhism are hard to see. This state too is hard to see. The pacification of all fabrications, the relinquishing of all acquisitions, the ending of craving, dispassion, cessation, unbinding. And if I were to teach the Dhamma, and if others would not understand me, that would be tiresome for me, tr troublesome for me. As the Blessed One reflected thus, his mind inclined to dwelling at ease, not to teaching the Dhamma. So after the Buddha became enlightened, he did not want to teach. <laughs> he thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be really tough. <laughs> These humans have a lot of greed and anger and delusion, and I'm, I'm not really interested in it. So um, he decided not to teach. But there was a Brahma, so a divine being, um, who became aware of this situation. And he said, the world is lost. The world is destroyed. The mind of the Tathagata, the Arahant, the rightly self-awakened one inclines to dwelling at ease, not to teaching the Dhamma. So he goes to the Buddha and he asks, he pleads with the Buddha, will you please teach the Dhamma? There are beings with little dust in their eyes who are falling away because they do not hear the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. And the Buddha, after hearing this Brahma's invitation, it is said out of compassion for beings, decides to teach. And he says, after he tells his decision to this Brahma, open are the doors to the deathless. Let those with ears show their conviction. So this is about 45 years before the current sutta where the Buddha's at the end of his life. And in that interim period of time, he has taught hundreds and thousands of people. Um, I just think it's really interesting to think about the fact that he hadn't initially wanted to teach and that all of these teachings came from this place of compassion and wanting to help people see. So now we come back to section three of this, the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. Um, two important things happen in, in this section. First is that the Buddha has a conversation with Mara. Mara is, as I described before, this mythological personification of greed, anger, and delusion. In this section, Mara comes to the Buddha and says, now, 
Let the blessed one come to his final passing away. Let the happy one utterly pass away. The time has come for the Parinibbana of the Lord. For the blessed one spoke these words to me. Years and years and years ago, the Buddha said this to Mara. I shall not come to my final passing away, evil one, until my bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, laymen and laywomen, have come to be true disciples. Wise, well-disciplined, apt and learned, preservers of the Dhamma, living according to the Dhamma, abiding by appropriate conduct and having learned the master's word, able to expound it, preach it, pro proclaim it, establish it, reveal it, explain it in detail, and make it clear. Until when adverse opinions arise, they shall be able to refute them thoroughly and well, and to preach this convincing and liberating Dhamma. So he told Mara, I'm not going anywhere <laughs> until I have finished this task that I've set out to do. And so, when I read this section, I think about this care and compassion that the Buddha had for his students, for the monks, and the commitment that he had to stay with them until he was sure that they understood. And just thinking about, you know, if he had either not decided to teach or not decided to follow all the way through with this, that it's possible we may not be here tonight, learning these teachings, practicing this path. I also think um, it's really important to recognize the uh, relationship that the Buddha continues to have with Mara throughout his life. We often think, you know, uh, I want to push Mara away. I want to push my greed, anger, delusion away. But those who have practiced, <laughs> especially doing retreats and just paying close attention to the defilements, you realize that wanting them to go away and to push them away is not actually the cause for the defilements to attenuate. We have to accept that they're present and to understand them and to relate to, to, relate to them with wisdom. And so, Throughout the Buddha's life, Mara is present, but the Buddha is not confused by Mara. And um, in this instance, he stands by what he had said before um, and says, you know, I'm not going to leave until I've, I've completed my teaching. So, but in this case, actually, um, the Buddha says, do not trouble yourself, evil one. Before long, the Parinibbana of the Tathagata will come about. Three months hence, the Tathagata will utterly pass away. So this is the first time that the Buddha announces his Parinibbana. Notice he doesn't use the word death. He uses the word Parinibbana. So the final extinguishment of suffering. And after this announcement, there is a great earthquake. And Ananda, in amazement, asks the Buddha, what could possibly have caused this earthquake? And the Buddha goes on to explain eight causes of earthquakes, one of which is the moment when the Tathagata renounces his will or relinquishes his will to live on. This section ends with Ananda's appeal and what is referred to as the last admonition. So after the Buddha announces his Parinibbana, Ananda is very distressed and he asks the Buddha to stay for a longer period of time for the welfare and happiness of the multitude out of compassion for the world. And the Buddha says, Ananda, don't you remember? I told you many times that beings who develop what's called the Idipada, I don't want to get too much into this, but certain powers of concentration and kind of development of the mind, if they so choose, they can stay to the end of one world period, which in the translations um, amounts to kind of the full lifespan, the full maximum lifespan of a human being for that time period. And the Buddha says, I talked to you about this Ananda, 
many times and you never asked me to stay. So the fault is yours, Ananda. Herein you have failed. And I think about that statement and how Ananda must have felt in that moment, um, feeling responsible for the Buddha not staying longer than the three months that he's announced. And this part of the story, it was hard for me to understand at first, but as I was reflecting on it more and more, I was thinking a lot about relationships and especially the teacher-student relationship but also other relationships. And it feels like in this case, this story emphasizes communication and, um, you know, giving people a reason to be in your life or to, to live for something. Um, and it's probably more complicated than that. But I think there is this poignancy in the fact that the Buddha tells Ananda, well, if you had asked me, I may not have said yes the first time or the second time, but if you'd asked me a third time, I would have stayed for you, Ananda. And Ananda never asked. Um, and the second um, part of the, the sutta that I mentioned, or the second part of this section of the sutta, is the Buddha's um, kind of final admonition and it's a very, very well-known line, and it's going to come up in, this, in the very end of the sutta. The Buddha says, all compounded things are subject to vanish. Strive with earnestness. The time of the Tathagata's Parinibbana is near. Three months hence, the Tathagata will utterly pass away. So I've heard this line many, many times, and I'm sure many of you um, who've kind of practiced meditation and been part of Buddhist communities have heard it as well. And I think in some ways it can be a little bit confusing or almost kind of harsh and stoic, like just let go of the world, don't be attached to anything, be tough, sit still, don't cry. <laughs> um, but I think that, you know, and I have learned that an important, important part of this ability to let go or this process of letting go of attachment to form and feeling and perception and mental formation and all of the what's referred to as the khandas is actually learning how to trust and to feel safe in the space that remains when we let go of these things and in buddhism this kind of space of non-attachment is referred to as emptiness. In other traditions, it might be referred to like the eternal or uh, theistic tradition, um, kind of God or divine presence. Um, and I think that sometimes our fears about letting go or relinquishment relate to not knowing what we're letting go into, kind of what is that space? What are we left with? At the retreat that I did recently at Prairie Farm, we were talking about how there's this kind of fear of annihilation and fear of boredom and, and fear of sitting in that space. So I think when the Buddha says, all compounded things are subject to vanish, strive with earnestness, he is telling us that we have to be mindful, we have to be aware that the things of this world are not going to last forever and they can't be a permanent refuge for us. Um, but also to remember that um, the path leads to peace and this feeling of trust and this feeling of ease. Um, and it's something that we can't necessarily imagine or, or kind of cognize before we experience it. I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end. So there's a three more sections, and these will be a little bit shorter than the first three. Like I said, this is, this is potentially 18 hours of material in 45 minutes. So um, this, the fourth section is called The Last Meal. Um, at the beginning of this section, the Buddha is invited to a meal by Kunda, a metal worker. 
and the following day he goes with his community of monks to Kunda's house. Kunda prepares a special meal. It's called Sukara Mandava, and the commentaries are not entirely clear on what that actually is. But the most important thing to note here is that the Buddha tells Kunda to serve the Sukara Mandava only to him, not to his monks, and to bury the remainder in a pit because he cannot see anyone in the entire world that would be able to eat it and to fully digest it except for himself. Soon after the Buddha finishes this meal prepared by Kunda, it is said that a dire sickness fell upon him and he suffered sharp and deadly pains. But again, he endured them mindfully, clearly comprehending and unperturbed. And again, um, just thinking about how, despite this physical discomfort, the Buddha was able to bear it with mindfulness and with wisdom. And this is a bit of a side note, but it is said that the reason the Buddha experienced this kind of dysentery-like illness was that in a previous life, he had been a physician and there had been some sort of conflict with the patient or the patient's family, and he intentionally gave this patient laxatives and caused diarrhea. And so as the story and mythology goes, this was the ripening of the Buddhist karma leading to this illness. So after this, um, the Buddha tells Ananda that he would like to go to another city. And on the way there, there is this beautiful moment of just the Buddha's humanity as they're walking down the highway. The Buddha stops at the foot of a tree and he tells Ananda, please fold my upper robe in four Ananda and lay it down. I am weary and I want to rest a while. And I think this is just a really beautiful moment of, of kind of self-compassion on the part of the Buddha and recognizing the limitations of his body and the physical form that he's living in um, and taking care of it. And the Buddha then asks for water and Ananda tells him that the water in this area is not good. You shouldn't drink it. It's not clear. And the Buddha says, Ananda, go, go get me some water. And when Ananda goes, he finds the water to be perfectly clear and pure. And he says, marvelous, most wonderful indeed is the power and glory of the Tathagata. And then there's a conversation with another person um, about deep states of concentration and some of the benefits of those. Um, and after this, he asks this individual to bring him some new robes. And the Buddha puts these robes on and Ananda comments on how incredibly clear and radiant the skin of the Buddha becomes. And the Buddha responds saying, there are two occasions, Ananda, when the skin of the Buddha becomes exceedingly clear and radiant. Which are these two? And he says they are the night that the Tathagata becomes fully enlightened and the night when the Tathagata comes to his final passing away. The section ends with the Buddha telling Ananda to make sure that Kunda does not feel bad about the meal that he served him. <laughs> he he tells Kunda, he tells Ananda to tell Kunda that actually it's an incredibly meritorious action to serve the last meal of the Buddha's life. So make sure that Kunda does not feel remorse for this. And I'm going to skip one part for the sake of time and we're going to move on to sections uh, uh, five and six. So section five is called At Kusinara, and I, I've kind of thought about it as final instructions. So at this point, the Buddha and Ananda and all of the monks make their way to the Sala Grove of the Malas. And the Buddha asks Ananda to prepare a couch for him between two Sala trees. And he says, I'm weary, Ananda, and I want to lie down. And the Buddha lies down, and it is said that when the Buddha lied down, the Sala trees broke out in full bloom, even though it was not the season of flowering. And the blossoms rained upon the body of the Tathagata and dropped and scattered and were strewn upon it. 
and celestial mandarava flowers and heavenly sandalwood powder from the sky rained down upon the body of the Tathagata. And the sound of heavenly voices and heavenly instruments made music in the air out of reverence for the Tathagata. And the Buddha says to Ananda, you know, Ananda, these, these flowers are nice. This music is nice. It's all really great. But the best way to honor and respect and to venerate the Tathagata is for you to practice the Dhamma. That is more beautiful than all of the heavenly voices and the flowers and all of this beauty. And he's um, kind of asking them to practice, um, saying that it's the best and the, the kind of the highest way that they can honor him. And then one of my favorite sections in this entire sutta comes next when Ananda begins to express his concerns and his grief over the loss of the Buddha. I'm going to just read a section called Ananda's Grief. Then the venerable Ananda went into the Vihara and leaned against the doorpost and wept. I am still but a learner and still have to strive for my own perfection. But alas, my master who is so compassionate towards me is about to pass away. And the blessed one spoke to the bhikkhu saying, where bhikkhus is Ananda? The venerable Ananda has gone into the Vihara and there stands leaning against the doorpost and weeping. Then the blessed one asked a certain bhikkhu to bring the venerable Ananda to him saying, go bhikkhu and say to Ananda, friend Ananda, the master calls you. And that bhikkhu went and spoke to the venerable Ananda and brought him to the blessed one. Then the blessed one spoke to Ananda saying, enough Ananda, do not grieve, do not lament. For have I not taught from the very beginning that with all that is dear and beloved, there must be change, separation, and severance of that which is born come into being compounded and subject to decay. How can one say, may it not come to dissolution? There can be no such state of things. And he goes on to tell Ananda that he has attended to him with so much loving kindness and so much care over the years. Um, and he goes on to praise him and express his gratitude for him. And I just envision this moment as such a tender and caring interaction between Ananda and the Buddha, almost like a loving parent who is dying and wants to impart wisdom and love to their child. And it reminds me of um, some of the things that we tell our patients and families to say to each other as they're dying or as they're approaching the end of their life. Um, some of you may have heard this before, but, but what we tell people is to say, thank you. I love you. I forgive you. Please forgive me. Goodbye. So the Buddha is not only affirming the teachings and telling Ananda, you know, this is the way, but he's saying, and thank you, Ananda, for everything you've done for me and for your kindness. And he praises these kind of superlative qualities of Ananda to all of the other monks. So the last part of this section is um, the final disciple of the Buddha, Subhadda. He comes and he asks for teachings and Ananda initially refuses him and says, the Buddha is too sick, he's ill, he's, he's too tired, he cannot teach. And the Buddha overhears him and says, no, Ananda, let him come. What he asks me will lead to his benefit and he will be able to understand. And so the Buddha teaches Subhadda and he um, asked for, asks for admission to the order to ordain and Subhadda ordains. And then as these, story goes, these stories go, he becomes enlightened shortly thereafter. And then the last section of the sutta is called the passing away. And it opens with the Buddha saying to the community of bhikkhus, I know you might be thinking that after I'm gone, there will be no 
um, teacher and that these teachings will not be here for you. But that's not correct. The Dhamma, which is always present, and the discipline that I've given you will be your master when the Tathagata is gone. They will guide you. So he's just saying, like, I know I won't be here in physical form, but I've given you the Dharma. I've given you um, the discipline. And he asks this community of 500 monks if there is anyone who has any remaining doubts or perplexities as to what he has taught. He asks them three times, and there is complete silence. And he says, I knew there weren't going to be any questions because I know everyone here has at least reached the point of being a stream enterer. That is, they are um, kind of well on their way to enlightenment. And then the Buddha gives his final words, which we've already talked about. All compounded things are subject to vanish. Strive with earnestness. And I, I decided to create a revised version of these words as well that I think can be a little bit more accessible. And I think about um, this as I could see Mark maybe saying something along these lines. Um, it's kind of like wisdom infused with a lot of loving kindness. So these are, these are my revised last words of the Buddha. Dear ones, all of the things of this world, your body, your thoughts, your feelings, your favorite possessions are not permanent and will never lead you to true lasting happiness and freedom. I care about you and I want you to be free and to know peace. So I encourage you to follow this path with energy and faith and perseverance and love so that in this life and in your death, your heart and mind and body can be deeply at ease. After this, the Buddha enters a state of meditation and he transcends all of the jhanas, these states of concentration. The first, the second, the third, the fourth, he goes through what are called formless jhanas, comes back down to the first jhana. Then he goes back up to the fourth jhana, which is um, kind of described as this uh, place of perfect equanimity. And it is said that he immediately passed away from the fourth jhana. After this, there was, of course, a great earthquake and many beings, including some of the monks, wept and flung themselves on the ground in grief, lamenting that the Buddha came to this Parinibbana too soon. And then some of the other monks who seemed to have understood what the Buddha was teaching, um, observe them and just gently remind them about the Buddha's words on um, not being attached to uh, form and um, the things of this world. So the section ends by describing a number of celebrations. Many people come to honor the Buddha's remain. Um, it is said that the whole of Kusinara, where he died, became covered knee deep in Mandarava flowers. And eventually, um, one more disciple, Mahakasapa, arrives and pays his respects to the body of the Buddha. It is burned, and there are no ashes or particles that remain, only bones. And it is said in the sutta that water rained down from the heaven and extinguished the pyre of the Blessed One. The last part of the sutta describes the partition of the relics. They go to different groups of people who promise to build stupas and to hold festivals in their honor. And I'm just going to read the last um, several lines of the sutta, which it is said were actually added later by some monastics from what is now Sri Lanka. Eight portions there were of the relics of him, the all-seeing one, the greatest of men. Seven in Jambadipa are honored and one in Ramagama by kings of the Naga race. One tooth is honored in the Tavatimsa heaven, one in the realm of Kalinga and one by the Naga kings. Through their brightness, this bountiful earth with his most, ex most excellent gifts is endowed for thus the relics of the all-seeing one are best honored by those who are worthy of honor, by gods and nagas and lords of men, the high, by the highest of mankind. Pay homage with clasped hands, for hard indeed it is through hundreds of ages to meet with an all-enlightened one.
So that was a lot of information. <laughs> and I hope it just in, encouraged some interest in the sutta. It was very much the highlights. Um, but I think it's it's really beautiful to hear about this part of the Buddha's life and kind of the narrative and the humanity of the Buddha and his experience with a body that is sick and aging and dying. Um, I am more than happy to answer questions. I also know that we're approaching time. And so what I might just do is have um, invite Mary to do the announcements and then I'm happy to stick around for anybody that wants to ask a question. Thank you, Megan, so much for such, um, yeah, such a beautiful teaching. Very much interested. Um, I want to remind all the participants tonight that Common Ground offers all programs freely in the spirit of generosity. If you'd like to learn more about Common Ground, how we operate, or want to volunteer or donate to support the teachers' livelihoods and the center's operating costs, visit the website. I've actually put a link in the chat um, and go to the Supporting the Centers page and you can donate there. If you do donate online for tonight's talk, be sure to enter Megan Brendelin in the teacher box. Um, two thirds of the donation supports the teachers and one third goes to the center. Um, and uh, Megan's going to share the merit before we say goodnight and stay to answer questions. So there's a beautiful practice called sharing the merit. And we often do this after retreats and after programs. And you're welcome to kind of find your meditation posture if that's comfortable. And just reflecting on the beauty of all of us coming together tonight to learn and to grow and to contemplate and to grow in wisdom, hopefully, um, by hearing these beautiful teachings. And just holding the intention or the wish that these teachings will be for the benefit of all beings, our families, our communities, our nation, the whole world, all living beings. May the beauty of our practice and our open hearts and our dedication to living with integrity be for the benefit of all beings. I guess if you have a question, you could raise your hand, maybe. Um, I think we're small enough, we probably could just unmute yourself. Hi, Robert from the City Center has a question, so I'm going to move over for him. Yeah, hi, Robert. Hi. Thank you so much for this teaching. I had difficulty hearing from time to time, maybe the distance from the mic, but I got the gist of it. Um, I just recently turned 80, and um, I'm thinking a lot about the five reflections. I say them as frequently as I can, and so thank you for sharing your version of it as well. Um, I think I struggle with, um, I really want my passage into death to be a lot uh, more peaceful than I think my mind is now. 
know, in, in my current life here now. And I struggle with that a lot because I really want to be at peace with myself now and also when I'm preparing to die. And um, it's just a struggle for me. I, uh, because of ongoing issues that I struggle with, I think I'm too caught up in my um, uh, trying to solve present problems by myself and not letting go, which you refer to quite often. So, but thank you for the teaching. I don't know that I have a question there uh, unless you find one that you might want to respond to. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I think, um, you know, the Buddha provides this beautiful example and it's, it's a lot easier, you know, said than done <laughs> to, um, to, to go through some of these processes and, you know, being sick and getting older. And um, I think each person kind of finds what practices are most nourishing and soothing for them. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, I just encourage you to, to kind of explore what, what feels healing for this heart here and now. Um, I've one, one practice that I personally have found taken a lot of refuge in and, um, I appreciate what the Buddha said about the benefits of at the time of dying is loving kindness. The Buddha said that those who practice loving kindness will die unconfused. And I've said to Mark before that that is enough for me to dedicate my life to loving kindness because I've seen so much suffering and confusion <laughs> among people who are dying. And so that feels really inspiring to me and it may or may not be helpful to you. Thank you, that's, that's uh, excellent. Actually, today I had a medical appointment and on my way there, uh, a man was coming out who had no legs and I turned, I was walking and I turned around and I said to him, can I help you in any way? And he said, no, no, he was okay. I just dwelt on that for so long. What is it like to, how is he gonna get into his vehicle and drive away and all that? But it was, um, he was okay, he said, and I suppose that he probably was because he's learned how to live with that. But it, it struck me so strongly that, you know, I should offer help. Mm -hmm. I'm headed in the right direction. I just need to believe in myself more, I think. Thank yeah. you. You have it in you. We all do. Thank you. Um, Roseanne. Um, there was just one statement that I wasn't sure I heard properly, and it was after you talked about when you were talking about boot. And thank you very much, by the way, for this excellent evening. It's been wonderful. Um, but at the Buddha's deathbed, when he when he was expressing what the reaction, the most skillful reaction is when you are with someone who's dying, and I I think it had to do with just practicing the Dharma. But you used some words that I may not have heard, and could you just go over that again about how we act at the bedside? What what is our reaction at at experiencing someone else's death? Mm, yeah, so he doesn't specifically talk about that. He did say that um, kind of as he's lying on his deathbed, you know, um, it's not the flowers and the music and these kind of sense experiences that uh, I value the most. I value the most your practice of the Dharma. And I think, you know, just speaking from my own experiences and um, the teachings that I've learned over the years, I think being present um, kind of in your body in the moment with someone who's dying is really powerful with an open heart, kind of going back to the meditation at the beginning, allowing everything to belong and not pushing anything out of your heart in those moments. It's really challenging, but I think that is um, really a, kind of abiding in the present moment with mindfulness. Um, and then the, the words, 
you know, things that I've said to patients. Well, there's two different things. So I, we tell patients and families to say to each other, if it feels appropriate, thank you. I love you. I forgive you. Please forgive me. Goodbye. Um, but if you're with someone who's dying, especially in kind of that very end stages when maybe they're not even conscious and you're not really sure what to do, I will often say, I'll tell them where they are. So I'll say, you know, you're in the hospital, you are safe, we're taking care of you, you're doing everything right, you're not alone. So like, those are some words that I say to people who are dying. Thank you. I think the word I missed that I hadn't heard was just the word practice. I mean, it was so simple that I thought, oh, I must have misheard. <laughs> And the, yep, the, way, exactly. the way to respond, our, our proper response is simply um, um, with all the other things you just suggested, but simply to practice. Yeah, exactly. If we think it's simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Hello, this is Holly, and I just, I just want to say, um, my heart is just full of so much gratitude for this talk. So thank you, thank you so much. It's it's really meaningful to me. Um, I lost a lot of people in the last few years, and was at at people's side when they were dying, and and so this is just really really very special. Thank you. Thank you. I might mention for the those who've stayed on, if you're interested in this topic, there's a course that I'm actually taking right now and it's really excellent on embodied philosophy that is focused more on the Tibetan Book of the Dead um, by Andrew Holacek. And he, he also wrote a book called Preparing to Die. He's just incredibly um, bright and thoughtful and has, worked with these teachings for many, many years. There's also a really good book. I haven't read it yet, but Ajahn Analeo, um, it's, I think, mindfulness with uh, like aging, illness, and death, uh, something like that, but it's, it's supposed to be a very good book. Any other questions? I was just going to say, um, yeah, for me, it's and probably for so many of us, it's just the attachment to all the wonderful beauty of life and having to say goodbye to it. I mean, I found myself getting choked up reading Harry Belafonte's obituary today. It's like, oh. And just thinking about all the things that are changing in the world that aren't the same as they have been. And just, yeah, having to let go, that profound, profound having to let go. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, we still can celebrate the beauty and the joy and the love and we do that in the context of knowing that there's an even higher, greater, more stable happiness available. So the Buddha taught us to celebrate the joy of others, um, to respond with compassion and love, um, and also to kind of understand the way everything works 
um, and let go into the, the highest happiness, which is peace. The, the most um, helpful thing um, I've heard, um, Mingo Rinpoche was talking about how um, often people, their inability to let go is their concern for their loved ones that that this um you know that that's so so difficult because there's so much concern for the people that um that love them and Minga Rinpoche is teaching around that he said you know especially for buddhists is to remember the myriad compassionate beings um in this realm and for him and for some Buddhists in others, but all of these compassionate beings and as an act of, of faith to trust that those compassionate beings will be there for your loved ones. And that um, that you can you can sort of turn, turn your own compassion and love over to the other compassionate beings. And I just thought that was such a a beautiful teaching because in my experience that's there often is not at the very end but um sort of in the weeks leading up to it a lot of suffering around concern for for other people and and i just found that a very wise and helpful teaching yeah that's beautiful and I was talking to my friend Samuel the other night about um, kind of the dead relative sign that I see with my patients, which is very real. And it is when patients are visited by deceased relatives um, before they die. And it's almost always uh, within a few days, like one to three days um, of, of their death. But there's something that, you know, you have to be a kind of open to that, but I, based on how much I see it, I kind of am. Um, but there's something that's really beautiful about it. You know, a lot of the times it's like really soothing um, and comforting for the patient. This is really good, this teaching. I really appreciate it. And it made me cry and I, I never cry hardly ever, ever. And it's really healing for me because when, you know, when nobody is dying, nobody wants to talk about death and be reminded of the pain of death and how, how difficult it can be and the loss and things. And then when people are dying, we're so unprepared because we never got to talk about it. So it's really good to just open up about it and, and let it come out. And I, I really want to thank you. I'm happy for the opportunity and happy to do more <laughs> on this topic. I think this could have probably been like four lectures or four Dharma talks <laughs> over, over time. You just have to come back. <laughs> yeah. I have one question. Last person standing at the city center. Thanks for your talk tonight. Um, uh, I was very grateful I could help host on this side of things for you. Um, I have, uh, hopefully I'm not keeping you too late, but I I have in the, has it's fairly recently, last couple, well, maybe last couple of years, had two fam family members who, who passed like pretty unexpectedly, you know, like no one really expected it and they were um, not prepared at all. So this is different end of the spectrum than we've been talking about a little bit. And I think, I'm just wondering if there's like anything for, you know, for the remaining members, like if, if you have anything from the context of the practice that I could think about, I think I've got to the point where it's just like acceptance. There's not anything I can do about the situation and, and how they went and how they were prepared. Um, but I think sometimes it still is like, there's a slight unease about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think two things come to mind. I think um, in the Tibetan tradition, there's some even more kind of nuanced, like actual practices for kind of post-death um, 
kind of sending merit and good wishes to the deceased. But I think, you know, something that I've done with family members that have died, I know you're not, you're not technically, I think, supposed to send metta to someone who's deceased, but to just, you know, bringing their memory to your mind and heart and kind of like we did in this practice tonight, just holding it with care and just seeing what comes up for you. And um, I imagine, you know, a lot of things will, especially if it was a sudden death. Um, but but just practicing kind of sitting with that, with their memory, with their pre presence um, and with gratitude for the the good parts of your relationship, the beauty that they brought to the world, um, and a willingness to feel any sadness that comes up and to let it move. The other practical thing that I recommend to my patients, family members, people who have had a loss, is that um, the relationship never ends. It doesn't have to end. And you can figure out ways to continue it, whether that's through writing, you know, writing them a letter, journaling, um, doing an activity that they loved, like carrying something on that they started, um, recognizing how they show up in you as a person. Um, so just kind of recognizing that continuity, that connectedness that is always there. Thank you. Hi, Meg, this is Adam. I want to thank you for your, your talk tonight. Um, so much to think about. One thing that rises to the top for me is uh, the grasping that I have done and I've witnessed others too of holding on to loved ones who are in the process of dying and wondering how we may keep them around, maybe past their comfort level. Um, where you know part of our practice is to to let go um so i'm just think holding that and thinking about that but i i am i'm fascinated about when you spoke about the buddha's skin and i've witnessed um in witnessing elders pass in hospice how the skin changes especially in the last couple hours and wondering um if there's any teachings on what transmission actually happens for um, perhaps not the Buddha, but folks like ourselves in that last um, handful of hours. I wonder if you can speak to that. Yeah, so I'm still a student of this. This would be kind of more spoken um, spoken to in that Tibetan tradition and the course um, that I mentioned, but you know, there's these external signs of dying. Um, which are pretty well characterized. You know, this is what we teach medical students and residents. Patients begin to become more sleepy, lose consciousness, obviously stop eating and drinking. There's changes in breathing. You can have irregular breathing, rasp, raspy kind of rattled breathing. The pulses change. People can get modeling of the skin. Um, and uh, temperature changes and in the kind of Tibetan Buddhist Ayurvedic yoga traditions this all corresponds to kind of the dissolution of each of the elements so earth water fire air space um, so there's kind of the external signs and then it said there's kind of these internal processes um, of consciousness kind of moving uh, and then eventually transitioning through these bardos um, that happen after death. And I'm not, a, I'm not quite ready to teach on that <laughs> topic. But um, yeah, there are these obvious signs. I think, I think that radiance, I've seen that too with, with some people, kind of like that young woman I talked about who was just so at peace. 
and so wise, like beyond her years, she had this like lightness and radiance about her. And so I think it does maybe reflect one's spirit and one's kind of um, clarity. The other thing I'll just follow up is we have so many family meetings in the hospital where we have to gently redirect the family who is often making decisions because someone doesn't have the ability anymore. Gently redirect the family to what would the patient want, not what do you want. <laughs> um, you know, if, this, if the patient could be here with us today, what do you think they would say? And sometimes when we do that reframing, the family's like, oh my gosh, they wouldn't want to be kept alive like this. And they realize that like we were doing this for us. And so encouraging families to allow, to give their loved one permission to die and to let go can be important. Any other questions? Well, maybe at some point I could even just do kind of a stories from the field and a question and answer, you know, for uh, questions about kind of end of life and death and dying, that sort of thing. All right, if there's no more questions, I'll let you guys go. <laughs> Take care.